There we go. So all set whenever you're ready. All righty then. Hello, everybody. Let me uh, get this right up here so we can get going already. <clears throat> Whoops. There. How's that? Harry, can you see that okay? Yep, perfect. Oh, all right. So um, I'm going to have to make some assumptions because tonight we're here to talk about tomatoes. But prior to considering putting a tomato in the ground, there's a number of things that you probably should have done already. And, uh, you know, we teach classes on how, how to do this. So the question is, is your tomato row ready? Have you had your soil tested? Has it been amended? Did you put worm castings on there? Have you applied compost? Have you done a regenerative soil primer? Have you put on biochar? Is the bed raked out to 30 inches wide and rolled with a bed roller? And do you have irrigation in place? Now, I understand that some of you may have like a four by eight garden, um, or some of you may be gardening in pots. And so obviously it's pretty hard for, for me to be able to um, target exactly what each individual person needs. But there's a number of things that should have been done um, prior to um, putting those tomatoes in. And you've still got some time yet because um, you don't want to put tomatoes in the ground right now, that's for sure. Um, I'm not going to go over this really um, at length. Um, I do teach a class on um, soil testing and what your targets are. And uh, I'm more than willing to help everyone read a soil test if you do it with Logan Labs, nobody else. They're the only, only lab that I will, I will use or read a soil test for because I know what the targets are and they, they understand regenerative farming. So if you haven't done a soil test ever, um, you need to do it unless you can speak plant. I don't think you can do that. Um, and and uh, even if you did one last year, you should do one again again this year. So get a good a good soil test. Again, it's Logan Labs, and uh, that's loganlabs.com. And um, you want a, a base test with extras, which is going to cost you thirty bucks. It's well worth it. Uh, so we're going to start off talking about the trellising system, and this may seem like overkill until you're doing like a hundred and forty foot bed um, full of tomatoes and carrots and onions and and uh, basil, et cetera, et cetera. So most of you probably are very familiar with those little cages. Um, unless you're growing determinate tomatoes, the cages are a waste of time. Uh, they don't really hold a plant up. They fall over, um, even if you've got them staked. Uh, don't use the cages. We're talking about tomatoes are going to be eight to 10 feet tall, maybe taller. Um, we've had them grow 15 feet. But anyway, to start off with, you're going to need some poles about every eight feet in your, in your tomato row. Um, I use Thompson native uh, lumber in, in uh, Rhode Island. Um, I just checked the price today, as a, as a matter of fact, because I've, I've ordered 20 of these. These are two by two by 10 oak. Um, they sharpen the end, looks like a pencil, actually. And they have a special machine that does that. And they're $3 a piece. Um, can't beat it. Cable clamps, you can click on this link. You can find out what a cable clamp is. You're going to need at least six of them. Turnbuckles, that wire that's going to go on the top of these poles, um, you're going to have to tighten that up. And we're going to explain all this as, as we go through, the, through tonight's uh, class. Number nine wire from Johnny's. It's what I use. It doesn't mean that you have to use it. You can use whatever you want to. Don't use rope or something like that because it's going to stretch too much. Um, number nine wire from Johnny's is, is a, a good a good bet. You can get wire at the hardware store. You can get it at the Home Depot. Whatever, whatever you want to do. But I do recommend the number nine wire. Um, screw eyes, one for each pole. A drill bit to pre-drill the hole for the screw eye, and ground anchors, one for each end. So this bed right here, um, this is uh, ready to be 
um, trellis, so to speak. You can see the post laying there on the on the left hand side of the picture, and uh, everything else in this particular row is done. And note that in a tomato row, we um, plant so we would have carrots, onion, tomato, onion, carrot, all in one row. They're all buddies. They like each other and um, they help each other and everything grows better when they grow with friends. So drip tape is in place. Doesn't mean you got to use drip tape. You can use soak a hose. Do not water your tomatoes from above. If that's all you got, then do it. But if you have the wherewithal to, to, to put in drip tape or put in soak a hose, um, that's really what you, sh you should do. Now, I want you to notice also that there's no mulch on here yet. And the reason there's no mulch on there because uh, we still have some planting to do, but in in particular because the carrots aren't up yet, and and, and so for mulch we use seaweed, nothing better. So you're going to need a large crowbar. Um, I have it marked at 18 inches, and um, this is what's going to start the hole for the post. So you jam this thing into the ground and kind of move the top of it around in a circle to get the the hole here kind of um, funnel shaped. And there you can see that the, the post is already, uh, the, the crowbar is all, all the way in the ground. Now, when I said these are two by two by 10, so most of you realize that a two by four is not two inches by four inches, um, but the two by two by 10 is two inches by two inches. Well, why is that important? The reason it's important is because how are you gonna pound it in? We use a sledgehammer because if you buy a fence pounder that is made for somebody that's running cattle or hogs or whatever, and you use a, a, a metal st a steel, a green um, post, and you can buy one of those pounders, which is like a piece of pipe with two handles on it, and and um, that slams it into the ground. But it won't fit over these these uh, oak posts because they're not uh, they're, they're they're a little bit too big, like a quarter of an inch too big. So um, you're going to have to use a step ladder and and a sledgehammer to get these in the, in the ground. If you don't want to go to Thompson's, uh, you don't want to get the two by two by tens or, or, or whatever, you want to do something that's easy, one stop shop, go to Home Depot and, and you can get uh, these things. Uh, I know in the, at the Westerly uh, Home Depot there, uh, when, when you walk in the door where the, where the uh, pro desk is and you just walk down the aisle and they're right there on the right hand side. Um, but the issue is, is that these are made of pine and they're not going to last any more than a couple of seasons, whereas the oak posts will last uh, considerably more than that. Uh, I want to get to these pretty quick because I want to be able to get to any of your questions that you might have. So I'm going to I'm going to zip right through these things and you're going to get this recording. So you're going to have all this information anyway. So here, you need a screwdriver and you need a sledgehammer. Whoops, sorry. And you're going to pound in the post. And then you're going to drill a hole. Now I want to show you something here. This is the eye bolt that you're going to stick on the top of it. If you're not familiar how to drill a hole for something like this, the width of the drill needs to be from the inside to the inside, not from the outside of the thread to the outside of the thread. So in other words, it needs to be this wide, not this wide. Okay. So you're going to drill that hole in there while you're still up there on that step ladder, and then take the eye bolt, stick the eye bolt in there, stick the screwdriver in there. <clears throat> Believe me, you're going to need the screwdriver, and turn that eye bolt all the way down so that the thing, so that the bottom of the eye bolt is actually sitting on top of the post. So this one is not in all the way; it needs to go a little bit further, like a, a quarter of an inch further so that this part is actually sitting on the top of the post. Um, because of the rocks and, you know, obviously we've got an abundance of rocks in this part of the country, um, you're not going to get these things in straight. It doesn't really matter. The tomato plant doesn't have a level anyway, could care less whether these things are 
or straight up and down, but it does look nicer if they're close to being straight up and down. Ground anchors. You don't have to have this one. This is a fancy ground anchor. You can use the ground anchors. You can get it at Cash Home Center. Um, you can get them at Home Depot. Just a plain old ground anchor will do. Um, these things are kind of expensive, but they, they, um, they screw into the ground and they last forever. They're made of aluminum. And, um, and it's got this cable on here already. And you buy one of these clips right here. And I'm gonna show you how this works. So you drive it in the ground with a, with a ratchet. Or you can use a post. You can use a two by four, I mean, sorry, a four by four post. Um, this has got a screw um, on the other end. So this is threaded. This is not this is not a wood screw. It's the hole is drilled in there. And then this, this is put into the hole and, then, and there's a nut and a washer on, on the other end. Please don't use you know, treated wood. All right, not good. And so when you put the ground anchor in, no matter what kind you, you, you're, you're gonna use, you want this ground anchor to go in right down to soil level. People will trip on it if you don't do it. Even, even yourself, you're gonna end up tripping on that thing if you don't put it down all the way. So the ground anchors are in and you gotta run the wire. And this is Emma. And Emma is, is trying to grab the end of that and see so if she can stick it through that eyeball. So you can see how tall these things are. They're in the ground about a foot to 18 inches. Um, they don't always all go in as far as they should, but it doesn't make any difference. Tomatoes don't care. Don't care. Cable clamps. <clears throat> These are cable called cable clamps. You, again, Home Depot, uh, Cash Home Center. You don't have to have this part if you don't want to purchase that. You want to save a little money, you can do that. But it does make the bend a lot easier and it, it will lengthen the life expectancy of this particular wire. So, so this is what the other end looks like. You've got this, come on. You've got this clamp here and then the turnbuckle. When you first put this together, you want the turnbuckle to be all the way out like that. So this should actually answer some of your questions that I know, know you've got is, oh, what is all this stuff? Um, so there's the post, right? And then it connects to the turnbuckle, that's all the way out. The turnbuckle connects to the wire and the cable clamp is, is holding the wire together so that this forms a, a loop. There's another kind of turnbuckle that you can use. It does make it a little bit easier. You get one that's got a hook on the end of it like that. Makes it a little bit easier, but it doesn't really matter. Um, whichever kind of turnbuckle you want, the key, the key is the bigger, the better. So the more take up room that you have, um, the tighter that you can get your number nine wire, um, you, the, the better off you are. This does not need to be like a bowstring. What I mean by that is absolutely straight. It really doesn't make that much difference. You just want to get it taut and you want it to be able to hold your tomatoes up without a lot of bending. This is kind of an important note for you to remember on each end of your row, You've got a, a post that is the end of the tomato row. And then you can see it goes down here to um, the four by four that's in the ground or the ground anchor or whatever. You need to put a cable clamp on the inside of this eye bolt so that when you tighten the turnbuckle, it actually pulls, as you look at this picture, it would pull the post to the right. So in other words, it, it makes it stand up straight. If you don't put that on there, what happens is because of the angle and the close proximity of the post to the ground anchor, it will push the, this post towards the left and thereby making it, making it weaker. And you really don't wanna do that. So that's why that's on there. Pull noodle. 
absolute necessity. You will walk into these wires. You need a pool noodle. They've saved my neck many times. Um, and with all the visitors we get, why nobody ends up getting hurt. Otherwise, you, you're going to walk into it. Uh, it's not a matter of if, it's just when. Uh, so you want to put the pool noodle on there to make it really, really um, safe as you walk around your, your garden. Now, let's say you've got a four by eight bed, a raised bed, and it's raised up 12 inches. Do you need to do the pool noodle, the turnbuckle answer? No. All you need to do is use the crowbar um, to put a hole in the ground so that the post can then be screwed into the wooden side of your four by eight bed. And then you're gonna run a wire from one post to the other post because you're at the very max, you, you should just have just two tomatoes in there. But if you had three, that, that's, that's okay, but you'll get more production out of two tomatoes. Um, so in other words, right here on the side of the post, that's where it would be butted up against your your wooden bed, and that will hold it uh, st straight up. Hope I'm making sense. Here's what it looks like. And you can see we've got some bends in here, not a big deal. You can see the cable clamp is on the opposite side of this. It's on, it's on the, the inside, not the outside. Pool noodles in place. And all right, this is ready, ready to go. So we need a tomahawk. Tomahawk comes from Johnny's. The nice thing about the tomahawk is that it, it enables you to lower or lean your tomato plants. So it's easier for you to harvest them as they get taller. It comes with a string already on it. And on one end of this, like right here, it goes over the number nine wire. And then you can um, uncurl this thing and let it go all the way down to the ground. There's a close up of it. And then you use these tomato clamps or tomato clips. These things are awesome. Um, I use these uh, to hold the grapevines on our fence. I use them to hold up cucumbers, peppers, uh, all kinds of things. And, and what you do is the string from the tomahawk goes right in here. And that ear, when you close this, that ear pinches the string and holds this in place. So you can see how I've got the string right there. And there it is around, that's a terrible picture, I'm sorry. There it is around the, the, the string. So the, so the tomato plant would be in this, this part of the, uh, the tomato plant would be in this part of the clip. All right, so use a grabber, unless you wanna go up and down the step ladder, use a grabber to put your hooks on the wire and then unravel that all the way down to the ground and um, and you're ready to go. You're ready. To, you're ready to plant. Um, these really, we like to have these in place before we plant. And um, you know, whatever works out for you, you can do it the, the day you plant, or or you don't have to do it right away. Especially if you're um, transplanting short tomato plants. A tomato plant really should be about four inches tall when you put it in the ground. And when you go to Pequot Plant Farm or Holdridge's or, or, or wherever, and you buy those tomato plants that are like 18 inches tall, and they got little baby tomatoes on there, and you're thinking, oh man, I'm going to get my tomatoes sooner than anybody else. Probably not. Um, actually, you're going to stress that plant, and you're going to put the plant behind, and the person that started tomatoes from seed and, and did not allow the tomato plant to become root bound or anything else, probably use a soil blocker, puts it in the ground and it will surpass um, and outproduce your 18 inch tall tomato plant. 
you have to remember that all plants have a life cycle and they do things in in their time, not your time or not my time. And um, so you don't want to interrupt that. As you, when every time you interrupt that, your stressor and, and the plants, you know, tomato plants are the wimpiest plant on the planet. Everything affects a tomato plant. And every time you pot it up, you're affecting the tomato plant. And so uh, if you're using a, a, a soil blocker, that is less um, invasive on the tomato plant. Um, but um, the point is, is don't get them too big. You're, you're wasting your money. Yes, I know you can take that 18 inch plant, you can dig a trench, you can put the whole plant in there except for the top two leaves and all that's gonna turn into roots. Okay. Um, my four inch plant still gonna pass your 18 inch plant. So, um, everything that you do needs to be inoculated. Every seed that grows in the ground, every transplant, if, if, you've, if you inoculated the seed, you don't need to inoculate the transplant. If you've not inoculated the seed, it's good to put just a pinch of BioCoat Gold in there um, to, to inoculate the soil. Um, if you don't want to spend the 60 bucks it costs for a pound of this stuff, that, that, that's fine. You might want to consider soaking your seeds for at least two hours in a diluted solution of quantum from green earth, ag, and turf. So we're really way past starting seeds in the side, but there's a couple of things I want to bring to your attention. You want to start them on the 1st of April or, or earlier if you plan on pushing the season and plant mid-April. Uh, okay, so what's the temperature out right now? And it's the temperature of the soil that's more important, <coughs> pardon me, than the temperature of the air. So, um, but you don't want to start these things like in February because then they're going to get too big and they're going to get root bound. So when you start them inside, you want to, to think about when am I going to actually put it in the ground and then allow about a month's time from the time you start to seed until the time you're going to transplant it um, into the ground. It's, a, it's about a, a month. But it is fun to do your own. You know, you can um, do them without lights, not the best way, but you can do them in a south facing window if you want to, or you can use grow lights. Um, if you've got a greenhouse, that's great also. But again, you want to be concerned about the soil temperature. They do have soil thermometers. You can use a regular thermometer if you want to. Um, and you want to make sure that your soil is warm enough. If, if the temperature is kept consistently and sufficiently warm, your tomato seeds will usually germinate within five to 10 days. Best to keep the temperature range 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The lower the temperature, the slower the germination. However, temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit or above 95 are poor for germination. Seed trays or pots, use a 50 cell tray as a minimum. You can get them from Johnny's. That's a good link right there. They're, they're good to have. Um, I know I was at Holdridge's the other day. They've, they've got something very similar to that and they've got the clear plastic little domes. That's a nice thing because it keeps the humidity inside um, of the, of the uh, seed tray. Works out pretty good. Um, or you can just seed right into six inch pots. Um, you just don't want to let the plant become root bound. And I know a lot of people use cow pots and some people really like them. I, I, I personally, I don't like them. Um, it takes a while for it to break down, and uh, I think it slows the plant down, but whatever you want to work with. When you're uh, watering your babies, even if you just got them from the local um, plant store and you brought them home, um, you're still going to have to water them or keep them under uh, grow lights or in a south facing window. You want to rotate the seed tray a quarter of a turn every day, otherwise you're going to get real leggy. And they're all going to le lean in one direction. And uh, if you're using a seed tray uh, under a light, you want to keep the light about an inch away from the seedlings. And yes, they do have square trays. Where that came from was 
someone said, well, if I've got five trays in my window and, and they're longer than they are wide and I try to turn them a quarter of a turn, they don't all fit. Do they have square trays? Answer, yes, they do. All right, getting ready to plant. Check your last frost date, all right? You're safe by May 10th, supposedly. Um, if you're not in the uh, 06355 or, or, or 378 uh, um, zip codes or Groton or London or whatever, um, if you're in Litchfield County or another state, you can you can type this link in there and it will give you the the uh, last frost date for for your particular area. And this is going to seem out there, but we plant our tomato plants. 60 inches apart. And we do that because we want them to get as much food from the microbiology in the soil as possible. And by having them too tight, you know, if you put them a foot apart, you, you're not going to get anywhere near as many tomatoes as if you have them spread out and you feed them regularly. So um, I just want you to look at this plant real quick. The main thing you want to be concerned about right here is the suckers. That's what these are. These are suckers right here, right? This is the plant trying to make more plants. Um, let me go. Hold on a second. Okay. So I want you to remember this because we're going to talk about pruning and how to make three plants from one plant. Soil thermometer, again, 70 degrees or warmer for tomatoes. That's important. Everybody has their own recipe of stuff they want to put in the transplant hole. Some people don't put anything in there. They just put the baby tomato in there and let it, let it rip. So here's, here's just a couple of ways. Um, you can take what, what it's worth. So you dig the hole. Um, you put in a handful of worm castings, a handful of your compost. I'm assuming you make your own compost or you're buying it from somewhere else. Um, Earth Care Farm has got wonderful compost, free compost at the uh, transfer station. Um, and you're going to add one, one cup of quantum. Um, if, you don't, if you don't take home any other information that I give you, please take home the importance of quantum. It will change your gardening life. It is not a fertilizer. It is all microbiology. It's about 40 bucks for a gallon, or you can, you can drive down there um, and see Joe and get a, get a gallon of quantum or a, um, <coughs> pardon me, I think it's a 12 ounce bottle. So put that in the hole. The old way of doing it, a handful of worm castings, a handful of eggshells, a teaspoon of Epsom salt, a quarter of a teaspoon of 20 mule team borax, a pound of fish guts. Where do you get fish guts? The place to get fish ducks is uh, fish guts is the uh, docks in Stonington. And you're not, you're not actually getting guts, you're getting the fish minus the guts and with two fillets taken off of it. Um, it's well worth it and, and um, well worth your, your trip to go there and do that. But it also gives um, you the excuse that your significant other needs to take you out for dinner so that you, you get some lobster and you can put, put part of a lobster in, in one of the holes. It's a good, good excuse to be out to dinner. A handful of compost on the last or top layer and a cup of quantum diluted one cup of full strength to four gallons of water. That's all in the hole. And now the hole is ready to plant. How deep to plant it? All the way to the last two leaves. This is in particular here, this is lettuce. That's not a tomato. Put a plastic solo cup ring around the tender seedling. So, um, we actually, this, this is a photograph I got off of uh, the, the internet, but we actually use a little red solo cups and you want to cut the bottoms out. 
And so you put it in upside down, you kind of screw it into the soil. This is so the cutworms won't get your plant or, or the um, slugs. Here's a tip. If you put seaweed on your garden, you don't have slugs. They don't like the salt. They don't like the sharpness of the seaweed. Um, and then what this does is it acts like a collar, a, 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 a um, protective area around the tender plant. Once the plant exits the top of it, it gets big enough to come out the top, you can take these things back off and, and uh, you don't have to worry about it anymore. So, and you can keep these things two or three years. So when you come into the garden at Coogan Farm and you see I've got like a thousand red cups around, you'll know why they're there. Something else that you need to consider about your tomato row is what am I going to plant with my tomatoes? And um, they have friends. And here's some good, a good link for you for um, companion planting chart for all kinds of vegetables. But here's how we do it. Remember that Mother Nature does not have a, a monoculture. She, she has a diversification of all different kinds of things. Um, it's because she's modern than we are. And so we try to do that, to duplicate that. In a 30 inch wide row, we've got a row of onions, a row of carrots, a row of tomatoes, a row of carrots, and a row of onions. We put four basil plants around each tomato. So here's another hint. If it works good in a recipe, it probably will work good in the soil. What do I mean by that? If you make marinara sauce, you put basil in it. They work well together. Well, guess what? They work well in the soil too. And the addition of the basil plants around the tomatoes will improve, improve the flavor of your tomatoes. And I hope you're using brandywines. Brandywines are the best as far as I'm concerned. A borage plant. Borage planted between every fourth tomato or thereabouts. A borage plant, um, the, the flowers are edible. Um, they're real pretty. But the biggest thing is they're going to attract pollinators. You, wanna, you want to have a flashing neon light out there. Come pollinate my tomatoes. And the borage plant is your flashing light. So put some boards in there and, um, and enjoy the buzz because uh, you're gonna have a lot of bees in the garden, that'd be good. We also use giant marigolds or calendula on each end. We vary it year to year, uh, whatever looks, looks pretty in the garden. So uh, do, do some research on your companion planting and you know, if you don't want to do onions, fine, do something else um, or, or carrots, whatever works for you in your garden. <clears throat> when you start to get serious, you've got to prune. Now you can go to the dollar store and you can get those little blue handled pruners. Um, they're nice to have, but these things right here, this, these, these things are expensive. They're about 25 bucks for these pruners, but oh my God, they save you time because when you are working the tomatoes and you're, you're tying them up and you're cutting off the suckers, you can see that right there is where a sucker's been cut off. Um, this just stays on your hand and um, you don't have to put it down and pick it up and, and all that kind of stuff. The only thing that you need to do is that the metal part of your pruners need to be dipped into hydrogen peroxide um, between plants so that you don't um, transfer disease from tomato plant to tomato plant. And at the end of the season, you're going to want to take all of your tomahawks, all your tomato clips, and also soak them in hydrogen peroxide and, and, and uh, sanitize them so you don't have that disease um, going from plant to plant. All right, I know I'm going fast here. But, um, Pruning the leaves, similar to removing suckers, pruning the leaves allows the plant's energy to go towards fruit production. One of the things you have to remember is that the, the energy of the plant is always there in its root system. And when you cut something off, you're not removing energy. Um, you're removing the need for the energy. So you've got more energy to go to the rest of the plant. So 
Um, removing the lower leaves increases airflow, which can reduce the incident of disease, which is why I've designed the system the way I did and why I don't like using the tomato cages. The tomato cages are too tight and they don't allow you to have good air um, flow through the, through the plants. As with pruning suckers, you want to use sterilized equipment and prune only when the forage is dry to avoid the potential spread of disease. So here's another tip for you. When you're working tomatoes, what happens to your fingers? Your fingers get covered in green stuff. So you go into the house and you go to the sink and you use some soap and it, it ain't coming off. And so you got to use a sponge with one of those little scrubbies on the other side of it and use that. Or you could take a green tomato, pull it off the plant, cut the green tomato in half and clean your fingers with the green tomato. It'll come right off. Then, then do the soap and water thing. So that works really well. Once the plants have approximately 18 to 20 leaves, begin to remove one to three leaves each week with sterilized pruners. The leaves most, appro whoops, most appropriate to remove are those on the lower parts of the plants. You never ever wanna have a leaf touching the ground. And to be clear, this is not a leaf. This is part of a leaf. This whole thing is the leaf. So we're gonna talk about pruning to three liters. This is why we do 60 inches. And where 60 inches comes from is SRI, which stands for a system of rice intensification, where the Uranals found out that if they planted 25% less rice tillers in a, in a given area, they would have a 400% increase in production. And the same thing happens with your tomatoes. What is the potential of a tomato plant? Typically, when I ask people, do you grow tomatoes? Yes, we do. How tall do they get? Uh, about four feet. And are they determinant or are they a determinant plant or indeterminate? What's that? So indeterminate means I haven't decided how big I want to be when I grow up. I'm gonna keep on growing until I no longer have the 10 hours of sunlight I need or I succumb to the cold weather because I'm a wimp. A determinate plant says that I'm only gonna get about three to four feet tall and I'm gonna give you all the tomatoes at one shot. And that's typically what the commercial growers do so that you can, you can harvest them all basically at one time, which brings me right back to the BioCoat Gold. When you use an inoculant, it tends to make all of your seeds germinate close together, which means they're gonna produce close together and they're gonna harvest close together. So pruning to three liters. Um, I'm going to go backwards to this picture right here. So this main stalk here is one liter, right? See, you've got the flower clusters coming off of here. If you allow this sucker to continue to grow, this sucker will basically become one of these things. So here is a perfect example. You can, you can instead of having one tomahawk for this main tomato plant, you hang up three tomahawks so that one goes to this sucker, one goes to the center one, one goes to this one over here, and they will grow and they will get just as big as this here. And from that point on, all the rest of suckers, you see there's a sucker right here just starting, you're gonna, you're gonna um, either pinch them with your thumb, which is the best way to do it because it keeps the juices in the plant, or if they get large and you went on vacation for two weeks and your tomatoes covered in suckers and you come back and you start snipping them, um, you're gonna you know, cut them off. So you only want three there um, if you're gonna have a, th a three liter system. I hope that wasn't too complicated. Um, okay. Now, so we've talked about how to make your trellis system. 
how to tie it all together, um, how to hold up your plants with the tomahawks, um, basically how to prune them. You're going to prune the leaves and you're going to prune the suckers, right? And if you have questions later in the season, you know how to get in touch with me. Just ask. Now, I made a statement, and I believe it's true that tomato plants are the wimps of the plant world. And um, so this is one way to tell what is going on with the plant. What is wrong with her? She's trying to tell me something. Um, this chart will kind of show you if you see a leaf that looks like this, this is probably means that your plant is deficient in something like this molendinum right here. Um, it explains all, all, all of that. But this is not a real scientific um, way to do it because you're kind of guessing. What I mean by that is what's the difference between this leaf and this leaf? They look pretty much the same, right? And so this one, well, it's not the same as that one, but in other words, there's, there's, there's some decisions to be made of exactly what's the difference between this leaf and this one. Um, the best way to be able to tell what is going on with your plant is the plant sap analysis. This is an expensive test and most home gardeners uh, wouldn't do this test. Um, it's done in the Netherlands, and but it 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 um, it has you taking a lower, fully developed leaf and and uh, still viable leaf, and an upper leaf, and you um, put them in a package and you send them to the Netherlands and you get a report like this, and then and depending on, and I'm not going to go into this in, in depth, but I just want to give you an idea about one way that you can really tell what's going on with your tomatoes. Depending on the nutrient and the mobility of the nutrient will tell you that maybe she's storing things in the lower leaf, which means she doesn't need it and, and has less in the upper leaf. So everything is fine. Um, and it could be just the opposite. So this one here with the phosphorus, um, this is telling telling us that she's not storing it she's using a lot of it it's being sent right to the head of the plant right away so this is another way to test your tomato plants if you're interested in this i can do a one-on-one -on -one zoom with you and really explain it to you in depth so it makes sense um and so that you understand why would you spend a hundred bucks just for the test um to get this to get this done so all right, good information. Everybody's got an opinion about tomatoes. And everybody's got good points and bad points, myself included. And so here's some more information for you. You can go to these sites. One of the best ones is up in Maine. Um, Maine knows how to do things right. If you really want to go to a great fair, go to Common Ground Fair in Maine. It's wonderful. Largest organic fair in the world. Now you're going to want to feed your plants. <clears throat> Um, this is important. You need to feed your whole garden, but especially the tomatoes. Um, this is done about every week with a liquid foliar tea, such as compost teas. It's not hard to do. It does require some kind of aeration system, like a five gallon bucket in a, in a um, bubbler like you would have in a fish aquarium. Um, and you would need a larger container like a garbage can to, to make your tea in the five gallon bucket and then put it in the garbage can add rainwater to it. Are you guys on city water? So I'm sorry to bring you bad news, but the city water is counterintuitive to your garden because city water has chlorine and chloramine in it. How do you counter that? A teaspoon of, of humic acid or let it set overnight before you put it on your garden. Um, it's, good, it's a good thing to have your water tested as well um, if you're if you're on um, city water, um, you can you can test it. But if you have a well, you want to have it tested as well. You you don't um, you're, you're not concerned about potability, 
because before you moved in this, to that house or you built that house, you had that done anyway, and you know your water's safe to drink. What you're concerned with is the hardness of your water. If your water is hard, no. any hardness over 70 parts per million will reduce the effectiveness of any amendment by up to 75%, which is huge. So just a little bit more information. Water is important. Um, green earth agriculture, not only do they have quantum, which is gonna be the best thing that's happened to your garden, um, but you can also get um, a tomato vegetable liquid fertilizer if you wanna do that. The key is to, 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 to do the foliar. When you do a foliar, that means you're putting a liquid on the foliage of the plant and you're doing it at the time of day in which the plants, plants stomata, the, the, the pores in the bottom of the leaves, when they are open, which is first thing in the morning. Um, they also open again in the afternoon, but you want to, to take advantage of the morning feeding versus the evening feeding, especially if you have slugs in the garden, when you feed it at night and, and have that moisture all night that attracts the slugs. So do it in the morning uh, before eight o'clock um, that's really when they like to be like to be fed and it will make a big difference. When you use quantum or you use any kind of a foliar, depending on what it is, um, you're probably going to see a growth um, spurt and a color change in less than two days. Um, it's incredible just how much your, your garden will jump. You can do this with with compost. You can make a tea that way. You can grow a lot of stuff in your own garden just to um, use as a foliar uh, comfrey. Uh, just make sure you, you contain the comfrey, otherwise your entire yard and everything else, your neighbor's yard and your neighbor's neighbor's yard will all have comfrey um, and because it does travel quickly. So that's just a couple of ideas. I do a class on foliars, well, which we get into really in-depth things in Korean natural farming, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have questions, why ask away. How do I apply a foliar? The simplest, cheapest way, an old watering can. This is actually more of a drench because what happens is, is that when you use the watering can and you, you wet the leaves, it's going to drip off the leaves and onto the soil. Remember, that we do not grow plants. We grow soil and the soil grows the plants. It's all about the microbiology. Um, you can use a hand pump plastic sprayer. Um, I don't think I've got a picture of that. Let me see. No, I don't. You can use a hand pump plastic uh, sprayer like a, a Ryobi has them at Home Depot. They're about 80 bucks. And I think they're, I think they're five gallons. I think it's what it is, but the battery, battery hour operated, it's, it works out very, very well. Um, the reason you might want to use a, 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 a pump one is because it's cheaper than the battery one, um, but you want to be able to get that spray up, especially when your tomatoes are 10 feet tall. And if you have any fruit trees, you're going to really want to get it up into the fruit trees. And um, so you're going to have to have either a pump plastic sprayer or a battery operated one. A mist blower is by far the best um, that you can uh, apply a foliar with, but it is also crazy expensive. They're about 400 bucks for a mist blower, but it gets everything soaking wet. It's wonderful. It covers a lot of big area. Um, you want to cover your strawberries, um, you do it with a mist blower. It's wonderful. And you can actually blow the, the, the leaves up so that you're applying the foliar to the bottom part or the underside of the leaf, which is very important. So uh, apply right when the birds start to sing in the morning, four o'clock. So get up, get out of bed and get out there and, and feed your, your, your plants in the morning. Uh, let's see, I don't think I sent you any of these. Um, I'm, I'm gonna have to send these to um, to Ari so, so that you, you guys can get them some good information there. 
Um, when to water or feed your garden? Again, this comes from advancing eco agriculture. Um, it would behoove you to go to their site. Again, it's called advancing eco agriculture. That's where we get up a lot of our amendments from because here's another tip for you. You did a soil test, paid 30 bucks for it. You sent it to me, I read it for you. I said, this is what you need to put in your garden. So I'm gonna give you dry amendments. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that you need to put on a, a, a dry am amendment, whether it's in a powder form or a pellet form or, or whatever. And you're gonna put that on your garden. Um, we do it in layers, we don't till, uh, we don't dig it in. Um, we just, we put it on our layers and let mother nature put it in through the rain. Um, but um, I just lost my train of thought because I want to look at the time to see how we're doing here in time. Uh, but anyway, uh, it doesn't mean that it's available to the plant. Just because it's in the soil doesn't mean it's available to the plant. So you have to go back to the plant sap analysis that tells you exactly what's in the plant. But you still want to do a soil test. You still want to amend your soil because it may not be, but be ready for your plant to absorb right now, but it will four months from now, six months from now, next year. That's why the old farmers did their soil test in the fall so that you could make the change in calcium or lime or whatever um, to, to change your pH or the health of your soil and have it ready for planting in the springtime. Watering the tomatoes, use a drip or use a soaker hose. Do not do it from above unless that's all you've got. Otherwise you're just asking for disease. There's some information on diseases for plants, tomatoes in particular. Um, this, this chart is gonna help you with pests and disease. Again, this is the main organic farmer and gardening association. Um, it's a good, good link for you. Bugs that like tomatoes. Basically, the only one you're going to worry about is, is the, the tomato hornworm. And you're probably not going to see the tomato hornworm. You're going to see his poop first. So if you see little black BBs all over your tomato plants, it's because you've got the tomato hornworm. If you see the, the little white Critters on the back of the tomato hornworm, don't destroy it, leave it alone because those things are gonna kill the tomato hornworm and they're gonna reproduce and they're gonna go after the rest of the tomato hornworms. So they are a good thing to have in, in the garden. You can do a, a caterpillar egg control release of beneficial insects. Um, and where we get these is Arbico Organics. And I think if you click on this link, it'll, it'll take you there. But Arbico, A-R-B-I-C-O, uh, Organics, they're in California. Oh, here we go right here. Uh, there's, the, there's the address to them. Um, we use a lot of different um, beneficial insects in the garden. Uh, we put in uh, beneficial nematodes in the fall and the springtime. And um, that kills most of our caterpillars. So we don't have an issue with any kind of caterpillars that are in, in, in the soil coming out and being a, a squash bug, et cetera. So that works out pretty well. Um, here you can see that the um, trellis is all set up and the tomatoes are growing up. Um, again, the borage, basil, calendula, marigold, dill. Um, just don't plant dill in the same row. You would plant it like in this row or the one on the other side of it. Okay, we had just taken this, all the stuff we have taken the posts out of it and flipped it over. That's why it looks that way. All right, so you've had your, your tomato harvest and now what are you gonna do? You're gonna remove all your tomato waste. Do not put a diseased plant in your compost. And you're gonna to wanna to rotate your beds until your soil is strong enough. It's all about the strength of the soil. Once your so soil is strong enough, you no longer have to rotate. Um, you're gonna add compost, add worm castings. This is in the fall. 
And you want to plant a winter crop or a multi-variety cover crop. Never, ever bare soil. Always growing something until Mother Nature kills it. You would broadcast a cover crop seed into your bed no later than September 1st, even if the plants are still producing. And then you're gonna pull the tomato trellis system out once the harvest is over. And the bottom of your two by two by 10 posts, I want you to mix a 50% solution of boiled linseed oil. That's a name, not a process. In other words, it says boiled linseed oil on the label. There's also another kind that says raw linseed oil. You want the boiled stuff because it has a dryer in it. So you wanna mix 50-50 boiled linseed oil with turpentine. You can use mineral spirits if you want and some four aught steel wool and apply that to the bottom of your posts. So these things are gonna last you eight, 10 years that you pay three bucks a piece for. All right, there's all the information right there. Um, this solution is also good for all your wooden handle garden tools, your wheelbarrow um, um, handles, which always get rotten and break. <clears throat> then you're gonna replace the handles. Um, this, this solution works on everything. Uh, save your seeds. So if you're using an heirloom plant, you wanna make sure that you save the, your seeds. Uh, what happens is when you buy seeds or when I buy seeds, anybody, they go through a, a set of sizing screens. And so the seeds that we get are one screen above Anything below this screen will not germinate. But the big guys got all of all of the big seeds. So when you when you take a tomato and you and you, and you cut it in half and you use your thumbs and you push out the seeds and the gunk that's in there and you look at those seeds, they're all different sizes. You want the ability to pick up all the big seeds and save the big seeds because every year they're gonna get a little bigger, a little bigger, a little healthier, a little stronger, produce a little bit more. I mean, we haven't bought garlic in a, a long, long time. And our garlic is, is huge. Um, so save some seeds, it's good for you. Plus the fact, I'm sure that some of you have found that you went to order something from your favorite seed company and you saw those words that said, out of stock. Save your seeds, use an heirloom variety, not an F1, not a hybrid. Then you wanna learn how to can, how to freeze, how to dry, because you're gonna get a lot of tomatoes. Your neighbors are gonna hate you. This is a good book, uh, putting food by, um, a lot of good information there to save those tomatoes. And, and um, you wanna make your marinara sauce and all that kind of stuff, tomato sauce, et cetera, et cetera. So get a good book on how to do that. Uh, we have discussed um, having a class on how to uh, put um, all the food by at, at Coogan. Uh, we just haven't got that, that far yet to do that, but it is something that we are talking about. It. <clears throat> so here's what your pant pantry should look like. Um, you can do that. You also wanna save water um, so that you've got that on, on hand. So I'm not gonna get into prepping, but um, all of the things that come out of your garden, if you've got a bounty, you can certainly can it. Here's an excellent book for you. Um, this is from Brian O'Hara. He comes from Lebanon, Connecticut. Nice guy, he's a brilliant, brilliant farmer. He's been doing this 30 years or something like that. Um, you wanna get a copy of his book. It's worth every penny. It'll teach you all kinds of things how to flip a bed, how to solarize a bed, all kinds of things. This is another good one. Nigel Palmer, he's a great guy. He comes down to see me from time to time. And um, this will give you some recipes on how to go out in nature and sneak around in the woods and get your stinging nettle and stuff like that, dandelions, etc., cetera, um, skunk cabbage and how to turn it into for food for your, for your garden so it's free. So the garden has the ability to feed itself 
nature definitely has the ability to feed herself. Um, and this book will help you do that. So that's, that's another good book. And then if you want to learn more about saving seeds, Will Bonzel, um, he's probably number the number one seed saver in the United States, I would say. Um, he's a brilliant guy. And that's also a very good book. And he's got a lot more in his book than just saving seeds. You can go to Amazon and, and um, go through the table of contents and you can find out exactly what it's got. But, uh, but if you're interested in doing foliars, then Nigel Palmer's book would be the one to, to go. So, but I, I would spend the money to get all three. They're good stuff. So that's it. Um, it was fast. I saved a half an hour for questions. And uh, so we're gonna come out of the share. And I know I buzzed through that. All right. Who's got questions? Bring it on. Thank you, Craig. Um, if you do have questions, you can go ahead and just unmute and ask them. We don't really need, there's a, there's a smaller number of us this time. Uh, I'm curious, um, should you put seaweed on the garden right away or should you let the rain or such uh, wash out the salt? Yes and yes. So good question. Um, you know, we are extremely lucky to live in southeast of Connecticut and have access to one of God's bounties here with seaweed. Seaweed is a facilitator. It has the ability to unlock trace nutrients in the soil and make them plant available that normally are not. Um, it keeps the soil moist. It keeps the soil at, a, at, a, at an even temperature. Um, it has a natural pesticide in it. Um, the only weeds you get with seaweed are seaweed weeds, and they look like little baby corn stalks, and they pull real easy. And so I get that question a lot, and we do it both ways. The only thing I don't do is I don't go in right when the tide is going out and get the seaweed that is soaking wet and then bring it home and put it on the on the plant. Now, people question the, about the seaweed, is there too much salt in it? And so what is the, I would answer that question by, by asking a question, what is the best salt for you in the world? Answer, sea salt. Um, and if you've ever looked at seawater under a microscope, you'd, you'd realize that, that the microbiology in seawater is, is crazy high. Um, so I would wait until the tide went all the way out and then the seaweed that is up on the, on the part of the beach that's furthest away from the water is where I would start to get that. You want to use a manure fork, not a pitchfork, um, not a, definitely not a shovel. That, that doesn't work well at all. Um, and you're going to get the eelgrass. It looks like confetti. Um, and it's going to have green stuff in it. It's going to have shells in it. It's going to have the calcium. Um, it's, it's going to have... Uh, uh, crab shells in it, and the chitin in the in the crab shells um, repel uh, voles and moles. They don't like that at all. So it's going to save some of your other crops, like your sweet potatoes and kind of stuff like that. So you know you can do it either either way, Mary. You can you can bring it home and put it in a pile. But what you want to do is instead of having a pile that looks like a mountain, you want to have a pile that's got a concave top, so that the water goes in the top. And then it'll filter it out. And then, um, you know, when it when it dries out, um, reach in there and grab some and, and smell it. See how it smells. Um, you know, seaweed is going to to decompose slowly, uh, which is a good thing. But um, yeah, we typically take fifty truckloads a year, and and so you could let that dry out. And then and then when you put it on your plants, and we use it on every bed. Some plants, you're going to want to, let's say this, my fingers are a Swiss chard. And so here's the, here's the leaves of a Swiss chard or a leek. It's a good example with a leek. You want to mulch your leek row. You want to grab a hold of the, the leek leaves and hold them together and then put the seaweed in there. Otherwise, you're going to get the seaweed in here. And then when you're, when you're eating your, your, your leek and it's a little gritty, you'll wonder why. <laughs> It's because of the this, this seaweed. So um, I hope that answered your question. If not, ask again. Thank you. It did. You're welcome. We found in Maine though, that the voles lived underneath the seaweed. I'm sorry, say that again? The, the voles lived under the seaweed. <laughs> um, 
And then they'd breakfast on one bite out of each beet or each carrot. Well, that um, try, try um, if you go down to Green Earth Ag and Turf, because you want to get to quantum, get a bag of, of crab shells. Yeah. It's, it's a chitin in there, yeah, because, because you're going to have a stronger amount of, of chitin. And, and, and we put the crab shells on both sides of the row as kind of, kind of a defensive wall, so to speak. Because the first year that we did sweet potatoes, the, the, the foliage was beautiful green, lush. And I thought, man, I'm going to have just a huge um, um, sweet potato harvest. And so I got the volunteers out there and they started digging up every single sweet potato. Somebody took a little snack. And so the following year, I did the crab shells, no more snack. Worked good. All right, next question. Can you put the um, seaweed on a sort of a perennial garden or is it just for vegetables? You can put it on every single garden because of the fact that it is a facilitator. You know, you put it on your flowers and we grow a lot of flowers as well. Um, we want the garden to, to be beautiful. Um, it attracts people to come and want to work into it or, or to donate money to the cause and, and help. Um, and it seems to enhance the color of the flowers. I know our zinnias, um, they're just gorgeous. And it's because I feel, uh, one, because our soil is so strong and, and because of the fact that we use, uh, we use the seaweed. Now, everybody knows that you're going to get a, a little bit of a drought July, August. The seaweed will help, help with that. Biochar will too, but seaweed will help with that by keeping your soil um, moist. And the question is drip tape on top or drip tape below the seaweed? If you put it below, it works better until it springs a leak. Then you got to uncover it and find out where the heck the leak is. Whereas if the, if the drip tape's on top of the seaweed, you'll see the leak right away and you can fix it. Do you um, ever advocate using mulch like sweet peat? I don't use sweet peat because I'm cheap. <laughs> Seaweed's free. And seaweed just does so many different things with all the minerals and stuff that's in there. Um, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to spend money if I don't have to. And so the seaweed is what I use. And I, I will tell you that, that I, um, I will put on um, shredded, key word, shredded leaves about every four years. I'll change from seaweed to shredded leaves for a year and then go back to the seaweed because I'm watching the sodium levels. And there's ways to get salt out of your garden if you've got too much. Any other questions? Well, this is an easy class. <laughs> I have one more question. When sure. I, went, I went to the quantum site while you were talking and it turned out that there were six or eight different types of quantum. Which type do you recommend? Well, no, that's a new one on me. There's, there's six different types of quantum. And it was a site I went to. It, it was sort of www.quantum.com. And it was oh, like, no. tell no. us about your your go, uh, golf course. <laughs> yeah, go, 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 to, go to Green Earth Ag and Turf. Okay. Green Earth Ag and Turf. Um, I would tell you what exit is off of 95, but I would probably be wrong. I want to say it's like 56 or 55, but um, it's easy to find. He's in one of those, um, one of those storage, like a storage facility, only they're not storage facilities. There are a whole bunch of little offices, um, buildings, machine shops, and all different kinds of stuff. Um, it's, it's right off the highway. You can't miss it. It's easy off, easy on. He's got all kinds of stuff down there um, and, and all organic. You know, if you're looking for weed killer, He's got some stuff that's vinegar based um, and, and he's got a lot of good stuff. You've got, you've got a problem with voles and moles and, and you don't want to spend the money for crab shells, then buy some, some vole or moles gram, S-C-R-A-M it's called. 
Um, and you can put that in the garden as, as well. But Joe only has one kind of quantum and it just comes in different, uh, in different sizes. A gallon will treat an acre one time. And that's another tip for, for uh, gardeners. You must know your square feet plantable. If you do a soil test and you ask me for advice on what to put into your garden, I can't do it without knowing exactly what size area is it you're trying to fix. I don't care about your walkways except for minerals. If you're gonna put down minerals uh, like azomite, carbonatite, basalt, then that covers your entire garden, your walkways and 10 feet outside of it. But for the amendments for the soil, you want to put it on just your plantable area. So um, you need, you'll need to let me know what that plantable area is so I can, I can give you some good advice on, on, on how to amend your soil. My tomatoes last year got infected with late blight in yeah. June. So I didn't get much of anything, but I cleaned, but, and one of the beds was where I had never had tomatoes before. So what do I was told the thing to do is to get a bucket, five gallon bucket or a half a barrel and plant my tomatoes in that using a uh, sterile organic soil and not even use the beds. Well, that's not gonna get you the best tomato. Um, and I, I will tell you this, uh, Mary, um, that if you're using quantum, let, let me back up a little bit. Gardening is all about the soil. It's not about the plant. And, and if the soil is strong enough because you fed it properly and you're feeding the plants pr properly, your tomato plant can get blight or there's a host of other diseases, but she can still produce provided, providing that you're, you're feeding the plant what it needs um, on a regular basis. The, the biggest issue is that people will say, number one, I don't need to do a soil test. And number two, I'm gonna put on 10 pounds of 10, 10, 10, just because I think the soil needs it. And then they don't put anything else on the garden until next year. Well, that don't work. That's like saying you can only eat once a week. It's not gonna be good. So when you do a foliar on, on your entire garden, in particular, your tomato plants, um, or your squash, you know, your squash, you get powdery mildew and all that kind of stuff. They will still produce, provided you're feeding them. And you, it's like going to the doctors. You know, you feel a little ill. You go to the doctors and the doctor says, let me give you a shot of this. And they give you a little jab in the arm. And, and you know, you still don't feel the best, but you're able to, to do things. The same thing happens with, with the plant. Um, so gardening basically is, is about understanding the soil and how to make the soil so that eventually I will get into a position where I no longer have to add anything to it. It is its own ecosystem and it's providing its own stuff with its own microbiology. I don't have to spend any money. It's good to go. I just need to feed the plant um, on, you know, on a regular basis. And we do that every single week. You know, you can, you can get stuff to kill the diseases. Um, do, you, do, you want, do you want to eat that, depending on what it is you're going to do? You, some people say, well, you got this disease, you want to put copper on it. Well, you should have copper in your soil. And you can tell that from your soil test. So, you know, I would, I would seriously, I'm, I'm an advocate of doing a soil test um, because we need to know what's going on with the soil. People tell me all the time, Oh, I just put eggshells in there. Well, how do you know the plant needs that kind of stuff? Do the soil test and answer that question. And let me help you understand the soil test. And then you, you make a decision that 
I don't want to do that in my garden, or I'm happy with the way it is, you know, or no, I'm going to go ahead and, and amend the soil and make the soil stronger. So my entire garden is, is, is much, much, much stronger. And the thing about it is with soil, when the soil is strong enough that the plant will bricks test above 12, the plant now becomes indigestible to the bug. So it is possible to have soil so strong that, that you do not have thick plants. Bugs only attack, and diseases, only attack a weak plant. And some diseases you just, you can't, I mean, it blows in. And, so, you know, some of these things, will, you'll get it because it's in the soil. You'll get it because it blew in. You'll get it because the, the cedar trees have got the those, um, gall and stuff. It all affects the garden, especially tomato plants. So anyway, concentrate on the soil and, and uh, you can get to the point where you don't have very, very little of bugs or, or diseases or or anything else. Then you got to worry about the hurricanes and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, you know, Thomas Jefferson said, albeit I'm an old man, I am but a young gardener, because we're always learning, you know, so. If you're starting with containers and you don't have soil in your backyard, where should you procure your starting soil before you get it tested and add all of the, your concoctions? Good question. Um, loaded question. Um, how much land do you have? Not very much and not very much sun. So I, I can't garden the way you are where, you know, I have rows of things. I, mm -hmm. I have very little south southern exposure yeah. and I'm I'm growing on the side of my garage. Okay, so it works, it works better for you to, to grow in containers then. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that that works, and you can turn it. You can turn those containers to make sure they're all getting sunlight, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so to answer your question, um, there's a number of different ways you can do this. Uh, number one, I, I, are you a Stonington resident? Yeah, Mystic, yes. Mystic okay. Stone. Oh, oh, this is golden then. Go to the dump and get some of their compost. Is it the best in the world? No. But it's not bad. I've, I've tested it. Um, it. It is very much like our soil is. It's deficient, particularly in, in sulfur, boron, manganese. Um, so isn't your soil. Um, so that's one thing. You can, you can go there and you can get that free of charge. Um, and if you have a truck, they will load one load per day in your truck. Um, otherwise, you've got to use that manure fork um, or put it in garbage bags and bring it home. Um, if, 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 um, if you can, you can get topsoil um, from a place like Fleming's and then mix that together with the compost. The key word is you want to add worm casting, this worm poop. Um, there's a number of different places you can get worm castings. Um, uh, the Wiggle Room, um, Monique, um, is a good place to, to, to get uh, worm castings. Um, the Worm Ladies in, in Rhode Island is another place. You know, you can get good worm castings and mix that in there. And, and um, um, so that would be a mixture then of topsoil, compost, and worm castings. And, and then you can put that in the bucket. And then you definitely need to, to continue to feed those plants regardless of what they are in, in your pots. And you can still do companion planting um, in, in pots. Um, and also the bags, the grow bags. Um, I've got some 30 gallon uh, grow bags um, that you know people use and it, it works out fine. You're still gonna mulch it with seaweed Nothing, nothing changes. Just because it's in a pot doesn't mean everything changes. No, it's all the same. Whether you're, whether you're farming a thousand acres or a five gallon, five gallon Homer bucket, um, you're still gonna mulch it. You're still gonna test it. You're still gonna do all these different things. Um, and and to, to your point is it's easier to, to do what you gotta do because you don't have sunlight everywhere. 
And so you, you do it in pots and I mean, you go, uh, get a seed in the ground, good for you. Um, I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. I always learn so much. Well, that's um, good. That's why you paid the big money. That's right. <laughs> I always thought that the compost from the dump in Groton, I shouldn't use that on vegetables because who knows what the plants or the is in it. What's in your water? I have no idea. <laughs> it's city water. What's, a, what's in the seaweed? Yeah, well. What's in the compost that you bought from Earth Care Farm? What, what's in the worm castings? I agree with you. Um, but unless you're, um, unless you have the ability and the wherewithal, um, i.e. the land, um, to be able to start from scratch and have no outside input, um, you're, you're flipping a coin. You know, you got to take that chance. The key is, it's better than the crap you're eating from the supermarket. That crap is 50% deficient from what it was in 1915. It loses another 30% within three days of coming out of the field. And we're feeding our children and our grandchildren 80% deficient food, and we wonder why they're sick. So better to, to, to take a chance, and, and I agree with you 100%, Mary, uh, you can't have control of everything. Get a seed in the ground, grow it yourself, enjoy that, that brandy wine. Nice thing about having a beard is the brandy wine, you get all the stuff in the beard. You got snacks <laughs> for later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Any other questions? There was one in the chat about where oh, yeah. to get. Where can you go to see you in the Mystic area? Um, yeah. I used to, I used to go. I have a place I go now that I, I made the mistake of telling a lot of people, um, and so sometimes um, I get there and there's no pile um, because somebody else got it. And I'm helping other people. That's okay. Um, Esco Point Beach, any south facing beach, after in particular after a storm that has that has uh, come out of the south. Um, and you want to go there at low tide and use a manure fork. Um, Esca Point, you can get it um, with, with a, um, a garbage bag, unless you've got a four-wheel drive vehicle to drive on the beach. And um, uh, Lord's Point, there's a big south-facing area, and sometimes that thing is covered. I mean, it have two and a half, three feet. Um, Ash Street in Stonington, um, people used to, and I guess they still do, um, they love it if you go over there and get it because um, the folks in that area don't like it when it turns anaerobic. That's why it smells. If you wonder why in low tide the Mystic River smells, it's because it's turning anaerobic. That's, that's what causes that. Um, so uh, and you can get uh, seaweed in, in, in Groton as well. I mean, it's all over the place. It may not be um, the best spot. You may not be able to, to, to stop, get out of your truck, and put a pitchfork, or not a pitchfork, but put a manure fork into a four foot tall pile of seaweed, but it is there and it may take you a few trips. It's, it's well worth it. It's, we've got this resource here. Um, the people out West are, I mean, they spend thousands and thousands of dollars to, to get seaweed or seaweed extract or, or kelp all, you know, out, out West because they don't have it. And we got it right here, it's, it's free. It'll change your garden. Hope that answered your question, Lori. Any other questions? Yes, I have oh. one. Uh, where's the best place to put your tomato clip on when you're when you're starting your plant? From so, the tomato. Uh, yeah, the, the the very first the very first clip. So your tomato plant is going to be out of the ground six inches. Um, put the clip at the base of the plant. So, so that's basically, because here's what's going to happen. If you put the tomahawk up on the, on, the, on the wire and you unravel it and let it fall down and touch the ground, which is how long you want it, and you don't clip it to the tomato plant and the wind blows. When the wind blows, if you are, are planning on, on doing a three liter system, those three <laughs> strings that are now 10 feet tall 
are going to wrap around each other. You're going to spend an hour untangling the confound of things. So take a, take the clip and, and, and put the clip at the base of your tomato plant. And then as the plant grows and as you prune it, then you add more, more clips. I mean, you might have 10, 15 clips on one, one plant um, by the time it's time for the plant to, to die. So uh, someone said, I missed uh, the beginning. How can I watch from the beginning? Um, you're gonna get this uh, recording from the library and, and you'll be able to watch the whole thing and you can watch it over and over again. You'll get so tired of seeing my face. You're just, you're not gonna wanna see that. Um, yeah, Eri says I'm re recording this and I'll send it out to, to everyone once he's had time to process it. It does take a while. It's not something you can do quickly. So give him a couple of days to get that to you. So any other questions? You guys got to come see me. We're at 162 Greenville Avenue. There's a great big blue tractor in the front yard, which may not be there too much longer. We may, we may move that. Um, you park in the lower parking lot and you have to walk in the signage everywhere. You can't get lost um, and come see the garden. I'm typically there, well, I'm there seven days a week, but the times you can pretty much count, count on me being in the garden, um, Saturday through Wednesday from eight o'clock, although I'm usually there by six, but um, eight o'clock till noontime. Um, sometimes I have to go out to meetings or I've got presentations somewhere else, but, uh, but I'm normally there. If I'm not there, then my assistant is there um, her name is Cora Lee, and she can answer all your questions. And you get to see it um, firsthand and see how, how, how we do things. And, and we love questions, and we want to help as much as possible. So don't hesitate to reach out. Greg, thank you so much again for this. Um, and yeah, I just want to remind everyone, too, in the, um, the email I sent out, the reminder email, I cc'd Craig. So... Um, his emails there. If you have follow up questions, you can go to, to the Nature Center's website. Um, and yeah, Craig, thanks again. I'm always amazed by just how much there is to know. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, folks, for making it. Um, I'll follow up with you with the recording once I've gotten time to process that. And thanks for making it. Thank you. All right, good night, everybody.